Hello, and welcome. Welcome to the start of Alumni Week at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. While the past year and a half has been an extremely challenging time, it has also been an opportunity for us to transform a critical public health moment into a crucial movement a movement that is characterized by marshalling resources to confront multiple and complex health challenges. They include, but are certainly not limited to COVID-19 response, reckoning with racial injustice, health disparities, gun violence, and disasters due to climate change. All through this, I've been so heartened and impressed by you, you, our alumni, who are tackling these crises by pioneering innovative solutions and making significant, and I do mean significant, and often unheralded contributions to improve the health and well being of the most vulnerable populations worldwide. Thank you. Thank you and welcome back to the Harvard Chan School for this virtual celebration. While our events this year will again be virtual, I am happy to report that after more than 18 months of re remote learning, students are back on campus this fall. Our buildings are once again buzzing with the resonant frequency of the members of our newest cohort of students. A cohort of students selected from a record number of applicants, an applicant pool that was up 40% over our high mark of 2020. These professionals who chose to come to school in public health are well aware of the great threats we face today. And despite that increased awareness, have chosen to join us to work to learning how to confront them. Rather than being deterred, they are motivated, animated, and charged to be contributing to bringing about solutions on scale to some of the most pressing problems. And to ensure that our students who come to us continue to be prepared for the challenges that lie ahead, we are pleased that our faculty and staff and administrators are able to introduce new academic offerings. We are launching, we have launched a new MPH generalist program. This is a program designed for working professionals who want to enhance their current careers or enter new ones. This part-time online degree program is accessible to students from around the globe. Our faculty and program directors, even while converting to a 100% remote learning institution during this pandemic, have managed to put together their assets and resources and talents to develop two additional new programs that will be launched in 2022. The first is a certificate in public health and business leadership a program which is designed to provide executives with the knowledge needed to support the health of their organization's employees and to make decisions that benefit the broader community. And there's also a new program, the Harvard Global Nursing Leadership Program, a program that is designed intentionally to empower nurses and midwives who are on the front line and are enabling them to improve the health outcomes of populations around the globe. Today, today we mark the beginning of Alumni Week. The themes of this week's programming is public health through the life course. And over the coming days, you'll hear from your fellow alumni and other dedicated leaders in public health who are making a difference in the lives of communities everywhere. We'll also celebrate the careers of six alumni award recipients whose work spanned the globe and encompasses a wide range of health concerns throughout the life course. 
I would like to just take a moment to highlight each of our award recipients. As you may know, the Alumni Award of Merit is the highest honor presented to Harvard Chan School graduates. This year, we are pleased to honor three accomplished physicians whose careers have expanded and I would say even transformed the way we think about the practice of medicine and the practice of public health. We are delighted to honor Dr. Paula Johnson, president of Wellesley College, who has advanced the education, health and well-being of women throughout her career with leadership roles at Brigham and Women's, at Harvard Medical School, and the Boston Public Health Commission. By uncovering and dismantling gender biases in healthcare and the sciences, Dr. Paula Johnson's work has powered a paradigm shift in the ways research is conducted and medicine is practiced, helping to improve health outcomes for women on a global scale. Our second honoree is Lois Travis. Lois is an internationally recognized expert on cancer survivorship. At the National Institute, at the National Cancer Institute, her research helped shape protocols used to treat cancer patients. And at Indiana University, she led the Platinum Study, which aims to mitigate cancer treatment side effects for millions of patients. We also honor Stefan Willick, who directs the Institute for Social Medicine, Epidemiology and Health Economics at Charité University Medical Center in Berlin, where his research focuses on prevention, health economics, and integrative medicine. Stefan also combines his career in medicine with a passion for music through his role as the conductor of World Doctors Orchestra, which is an organization that raises funds for medical aid projects. In addition to the awards of merit, we're also proud to recognize three alumni with Professional Achievement Awards. This year, we honor Hillary Marston with the 2021 Public Health Professional Award. Throughout her career, Hillary has coordinated responses to epidemics from Ebola in West Africa to Zika in the Americas, and now as Director of Global COVID Response for the Biden administration. Jocelyn Lehrer is the recipient of the 2021 Public Health Innovator Award, a researcher, a practitioner, and social entrepreneur. Jocelyn founded and directs the Men's Story Project, which explores social construction, constructions of masculinity through public performances and the world, around the world. And finally, this year's Leadership Award in Public Health Practice goes to Kenzave Arhan, who, who also is known as Vinu. Inspired by teachings of Gandhi, Vinu le le leads both the Shanti Ashram and the International Center for Child and Public Health organizations that provide critical medical and social services to a quarter of a million people in her native India. These exceptional alumni are changing many lives through their impactful work and the legacies they are building. You can hear their stories by watching their award videos, which are posted on the Alumni Week 2021 website. I have no doubt that like me, you will be inspired by their achievements. <clears throat> Today, we kick off a series of panels featuring faculty, alumni, and other experts from around the world. 
I always look forward to this time of year when we come together as an alumni community, even if we have to do so in this virtual event. Alumni Week is a chance for us to renew friendships, to hear about the latest research, and to make connections that often result in rewarding collaborations. On behalf of the entire Chan School community, I would like to expand, extend my gratitude to our outgoing Alumni Association President, Dr. Carmen Davis. Carmen, thank you. Thank you for your invaluable contributions, <laughs> remarkable leadership, and your enduring friendship. I'm also pleased to welcome President-elect Trishan Panchi, co-founder and chief medical officer of WellFrame. Trishan will begin this new role in October, and I'm very much looking forward to our work together. The past 18 months have made the societal impact of public health and scientific advances clearer than ever. And as a result, there will be an increased emphasis on education and investment in the life sciences and health-related disciplines. I know that you are as excited as I am to see where this renewed appreciation and long overdue investment in the science of public health will lead us. Supporting the advancement of research improving equity in health outcomes, and educating the future cadre of diverse public health leaders and professionals will absolutely be key to addressing the challenges populations face. And the Harvard Chan alumni community has a significant role to play in all of these efforts. So I just wanna take this last moment to thank you for everything that you do and thank you for joining us today. I'd now like to hand over the virtual podium to Professor Lisa Berkman, who is going to be moderating today's panel. Lisa, over to you. So thank you very much, Dean Williams, for your remarks and for recognizing um, all the achievements of the faculty and alumni out there and the important kinds of missions that we have. I wanna welcome you all to Alumni Week um, 2021 and to our panel on healthy aging across the life course. I'm Lisa Berkman, I'm the director of the Harvard Center for Population and Development Studies and I'm the Thomas Cabot Professor of Public Policy and of Epidemiology and Global Population and Health um, at the Harvard Chan School. So I welcome you from Boston. Um, this panel is the kickoff discussion um, and part of Alumni Week, and we're happy to be included in this week's program. Today's topic is, as um, uh, Dean Williams mentioned, healthy aging and healthy aging, particularly across the life course. We're going to look at lifetime influences on aging, various models of aging, and finally deal to some extent with solutions, things that countries and communities can do to create age-friendly cities, and also to think about the exposures and things that produce healthy societies. I'll be your moderator today. I'll be asking the panelists a series of questions I invite you to post um, all your questions on the question and answer box and we will have time to get to, I hope all of them. Um, for ease of use, if you have a question, please submit them directly to the question and answer box. One of the Harvard Chan frontiers is a focus on reimagining aging. Soon and actually currently in many countries, we have more people over 65 than under the age of five for the first time since anybody has begun counting. This will create a massive change in how people live, learn, how, learn they, how they work across the globe. Here at the Harvard Chan School, we're uncovering how aging people and societies can live healthier and happier lives. This fits well in today's topic on healthy um, aging, so we'll drop a link to learn more about the Harvard Chan Frontiers. 
I want to um, recognize the extent to which I think all the panelists today, as well as myself, are centrally interested in the kind of social determinants of health and the ways in which the rest of the panels that you will hear in coming days have an impact on aging. When we think about the ways in which inequality has spread um, and produces inequalities in aging, it's certainly one of the foremost conditions that we wanna think about. So I'd like to get um, started with the conversation and I'm going to introduce um, each of our panelists. Today we have Dr. Alexander Kalesh, who is president of the International Longevity Center in Brazil and co-director of the Age Friendly Institute in Boston. He is also the former director of the Department of Aging and Life course for WHO. And in that role, he conceived and published the political framework for active aging and age-friendly cities. Our second panelist is Dr. Yoav Ben Shlomo, who is professor of clinical epidemiology at Bristol Medical School in the UK. With Professor Diana Koo at University College London, they have published both theoretical and empirical research on life force influences on chronic diseases and is one of the leaders in developing life course models. He is a member of the NIHR Applied Research Collaboration and involved with running all the OSPAC, which is a large cohort, which maybe you'll say a word about, you have birth cohort and the Kefferly and Speedwell studies. It's really a pleasure um, to have you both with us here today. Um, so thank you both for joining us. Um, why don't we get started? I think, Yoav, I believe you'll go first. Um, so we're going to start um, with a brief presentation and um, then we'll switch and hear from Dr. Kalesh. Thank you very much, Lisa, for your introduction. Um, so I thought I'd better just start off with a definition so at least we all make sure we know what we're talking about. Uh, importantly, if you see in the title of the slide, it says revival in the 1990s. Uh, and one thing that myself and both Daiku, who I've worked extensively with, extensively with, always try and point out, this is not something we've invented. The ideas and general concepts behind life course epidemiology, you can find references to them over the last hundred years. What happened in the 1990s, actually when I started off my epi epidemiological career, was we suddenly got new data, which made, got us very excited about how early life could determine chronic diseases in later life. Um, so that's why we said revival in the 1990s. The key thing here is, as in, if you look at the definition, is we're looking at very long-term effects of things that can happen in gestation, childhood, adolescence, and so on, and can also have intergenerational transmission. But the other thing that we felt was very important to highlight is we weren't just interested in the biology or the behavior or the social, we were interested in the integration of all three of these factors uh, and how they operated. And that's mainly because, <clears throat> as Lisa mentioned, at that time, um, there were existing models, uh, general conceptual models. One was known as the adult lifestyle model. Some people would derogatory call it the black box model of epidemiology, mainly focusing on midlife exposures such as obesity or smoking and so on, and lifestyle. However, there was a longer tradition of social epidemiology, looking at things like socioeconomic status, occupation, and how they determine people's risk of later disease. And then finally, as I said, what emerged in the 1990s, mainly through the initial work of Professor David Barker in Southampton, now known as the developmental model, which was basically looking at how fetal and postnatal and childhood development could itself program later diseases. If I could have the next slide, please. So um, the sort of innovation that we first introduced uh, was to try and say, well, okay, it all sounds very, <laughs> plausible that things that happen to you from birth to late life are important. How do they actually operate? How can we empirically test whether these ideas are actually important? And so we, um, again, we didn't invent these. We pulled together what we thought was already out there in the psychological demographic literature and so on. And we identified several different life course models. So the one that was getting a lot of attention in the 90s what was known as the critical or sensitive period model, because it was focusing on how a baby developed as very crudely measured by the birth weight and how birth weight predicted things like heart disease, diabetes, and stroke. But clearly, um, those things themselves may not be so deterministic. There may well be interactions with later life effect modifiers. 
But the other thing that we were very interested, particularly from the social epidemiological world, was what's known as accumulation of risk, actually first named by uh, John Riley, the demographer, which is how things accumulate over your life course and operate in different pathways. And if we could go on to the next slide. Oh, there's one missing. Ah. <laughs> um, OK, that's interesting. Um, sorry, there should have been one with boxes. I don't know if there is further on. OK, no worry. No worries. Go back. Somehow one slide's got lost in my presentation. Let me just explain. So. When you think about an accumulation of risk, you can think about it in different ways. One is that your risks are totally random or independent. So someone who's exposed to risk A is no more or less likely to get risk B or risk C. Now, in the real world, that's extremely unlikely because lots of risk factors cluster together, what we call the risk clustering model. And that's often because of things like childhood poverty or adult poverty, where not only might you have a bad diet, you may live in a bad environment, you may be more exposed to infectious diseases. So that would be a much more realistic scenario. But the other pathway that we were really interested in is what we call the chains of risk model, where a risk factor, say A, goes on to another, itself can determine another, another risk factor, B, and then a third risk factor, C, and those cumulatively could either produce disease, each, each having some influence, or it could actually, be, that would be the additive chain of risk model, or it could actually be what we call a trigger model, where it's actually the, only the last risk factor that's clearly important. And you can think about this in many different ways. For example, if one's interested in what are the causes of dementia, there's observational evidence that people who have poor hearing or hearing loss in midlife um, go on and have a greater risk of getting dementia. We could argue whether that's actually because <clears throat> that's a prodromal feature. In other words, very early pathology, well before you get your dementia, causes hearing loss. But let's assume it isn't that reason. So if you have hearing loss, one of the things that may happen is you may be more likely to be socially isolated. You may not wish to go out as much um, and engage with people. And if you're socially isolated, you may have more, less cognitive stimulation, uh, what's known as the use it or lose it hypothesis. So the very fact that you have less cognitive stimulation itself may influence the rate of decline uh, of neuronal damage and therefore lead to dementia. If we go on to the, the next slide, Great, so I wanted to illustrate this. Um, and just to make an important point, so if you have a look at this graph, it shows four hypothetical tra trajectories. At the y-axis, I've talked about intrinsic capacity. Sorry, not, we haven't gotten to that one yet. I'll tell you when to press the OK. Um, we talk about intrinsic capacity, and there's a horizontal red line. And we're assuming that when your tray, and it could be cognitive function, it could be a respiratory function or lung function, it could be your grip strength or muscle function. But when you reach a certain level, you start to get clinical problems or functional problems, and you eventually go to a doctor who will probably give you a diagnosis. And in medicine, we like to keep things simple. We like to dichotomize the world. Wow. OK, sorry, I hadn't asked it. Anyway, um, so we say you have disease or not. But the key thing is, how did you get to reach that critical threshold? So as you can see from the graph, there are different ways to reach that critical threshold. And in uh, so for some reason, the slides are progressing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so obviously, in public health, we're all aware of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Um, so if I start up with tertiary prevention, that's what most clinical medicine does. If we could click on the, the mouse now. So we actually take people with established disease, and we try and intervene to slow down the rate. Um, and that's what usually that's with pharmacological treatment. If we go on to that, if you press the button again. However, just as effective if we could do it, if we could maintain people at their optimal function at that plateau level and delay the decline, then they may never get the disease because they might die something else or they might get it at a very old age. And finally, if you press the return button again, if we could improve the development of that trait. So for example, there's quite good evidence that educational years can enhance your cognitive function. We could, in, we could increase what's known as the cognitive reserve. So if you start off at a high point, you're less likely to reach that clinical threshold. So those are very different strategies, but all of them with the aim to reduce the number of populations who go below that clinical threshold. I think I'll pass over to Alex now. Thank you very much, Rob. And thank you, Lisa. Thanks for the invitation, the opportunity to present here. It's always difficult to follow you up. 
but we are really talking about the importance of Flexbox. Next slide, please. This is a simplified version of what you offer. And this is what I brought to WHO uh, when I was appointed in 1994 uh, to be the director of the WHO program on aging and health. What I inherited was a long list of diseases. And I said, no, this is not what I want to do. I want to bring the importance of aging. We are all aging and therefore the life course becomes of paramount importance. And very quickly, what we want is to live our lives in the red line uh, so that we can grow our functional capacity in the stages of development and growth, childhood and early adulthood. And then there will be a decline, it's inevitable, it's to do with aging. But what we want to avoid is the yellow line, that we never reach the peak and we'll go fast into decline and you hit the disability threshold. It's not a line, it is a bar, because you can manipulate this disability threshold by changing the environment where individuals live. But you can see the difference between what is to reach the age of 85 above the disability threshold, while the other person may have a stroke at the age of 58. It was that hypertension that could have been avoided, but was not and the complications and lack of services globally, we are aging prematurely and in bad shape. And you may need care, be alive for 30 years, but the difference is dismal. Could you just click now? And that's the good news. At any point of our lives, we can intervene individually or at a societal level through policies. And maintain ourselves above the disability uh, threshold for longer. And that is what animates uh, and gives uh, enthusiasm for policies that can help us to age, uh, the healthy aging and to keep our life course uh, free of disabilities. Next, please. And there is a mantra here. The earlier you start preparing yourself to longevity in, and to age well, the better, but it is never too late. And repeat this, the earlier the better, but it's never too late. Next. Next. When I joined WHO, uh, we soon after launched the active aging policy framework, which incorporates this model and this thinking. Uh, next. Since I left, next, um, our International Longevity Center made a revision in 2017. This is available in our site, but it is really complementary. And next, and what is the definition of active aging? It's the process, process throughout life of optimizing opportunities for health, lifelong learning, participation, and security. With health and lifelong learning, we have the assets so that we can participate in society. But we also need the protection, security, that if we don't have good health and we don't have, if we have not accumulated uh, knowledge, we can still be protected by a caring society. Next. How I translate this uh, in, for lay people, it's simple. We need to accumulate the four capitals uh, in order to age well. Next. First, of course, is health. And I think this is universal. Everybody wants to grow older, but in good health. Next. And this is inspired by the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion that WHO launched in 1986. Health is created within the context of every day's life, where individuals live, work, get entertainment, eat, move, love. That is where health is created. Therefore, the social determinants of paramount importance. The next, please. And here is another way to present the life course, the scope for non-communicable diseases prevention. We, when we are born, we may have a slightly higher risk compared to another individual. 
but as we grow older, older we will have a very different accumulated risk and the range could be huge. And in a way, I am responding to a question from Sally Selkuk about this. Next, please. Lifelong learning, knowledge, next. So health and knowledge, but also you need social capital. The next, please. And the financial, if you can save. And I know that many people are aging in poverty and tremendous and increasing inequalities. Next. To that, I would add purpose. Next. Without ever blaming the victim for the lack of opportunities to age well. I will stop here and I think that I will be able to add more concepts as we go on. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, thank you all for um, giving us really a very, very good overview and actually touching on really virtually all the important issues. So I'd like to start out with a question that I'd like you both to respond to. That's really a, um, in part a clarification of terms and in part um, to hear your focus on what you think is really important. Um, so uh, along two dimensions, people often use terms quite interchangeably. And for those of us um, not centrally interested in aging, often these are um, interchangeable when they're, they're not really interchangeable to many of us. So I would say along one kind of spectrum, there's an issue of what we mean when we say life course and development and life cycle and the models, Joab, that you um, so beautifully kind of um, showed, showed us in terms of it's, you know, in, in terms of saying it's much more than just, you know, what you were born with, although what you were born with counts um, to it. And then along another dimension, there's another set of fuzzy terms that we often use with health expectancies or life expectancy or lifespan, um, which also has very specific meanings that are sometimes very different depending on the discipline. And um, Alex, you even added the idea of active aging, which I think actually is quite congruent with this idea of how we, how we think about what is the outcome that we're most interested in. So I wonder whether you could both comment on that and perhaps you have um, addressed really the, the life course kinds of issues and Alex focus a little bit more on the expectancy and span issues, but, but um, you're, you're free to speak your will now. We'd love to hear from you um, about yeah. both of these issues. So Yoff, maybe first. Yeah, so um, fairly soon after myself and Di started working in this area, uh, we were fortunate to publish um, a life course glossary in the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health, <laughs> where it actually helped us, but hopefully helped others to understand some of the concepts. And I think it was uh, George Bernard Shaw who said, Britain and the United States are two people separated by a common language. And that is absolutely true when you talk about the other social sciences. So I've been at meetings with developmental psychologists, demographers, medical sociologists, and we use different terms sometimes for the same concepts, and sometimes we use the same terms for different concepts, and it's very, very confusing. Um, for me, lifespan has historically follows from the developmental psychology world, uh, but is often referred to in the same way as I, as an epidemiologist, would talk about life course. Life cycle tends to be a little bit different, more from biology, it tends to be looking at specific times, like what happened to you uh, when you were a child from five to 15, and often it doesn't follow through what the long-term consequences are. But for me, the importance of life course is not just that you look at when an exposure occurs in terms of its temporal sequence, but how that exposure, if it's detrimental or protective, it could be either, actually influences things that occur many years later, either through biological embedding, some, some detrimental effect to your arteries or your cells in terms of early carcinogenesis, or through social pathways, your ability to get good education, which itself will determine your occupational opportunities, your income, and later life exposures. And that's the importance of life course. It has this long-term perspective. And it tries to understand the pathways or trajectories by which an early exposure influences things decades later. Oh, Lisa, for the sake of time, and I know that we are running late, I would just say that life course and life cycle 
uh, for me, they have a different meaning. Life cycle is wishful thinking. It's not a cycle, it is a course. And of course, that is what we are interested, to have a life course that will lead us to healthy aging and longevity with quality of life. Great, thank you. I think that was like, was very helpful. So um, we do, just to, just to say that we will at 1245 um, open it to other questions. So we'll continue this for a while more, but at 1245, we'll take questions from the audience. Um, so when we think about, um, to lump a lot of the questions um, that we had thought about together, when we think about what are the major determinants across the life cycle or across the life course, perhaps we should just now say across the life course, um, you know, um, Alex, in your slide, you showed socioeconomic um, position as, you know, as kind of your exemplar um, for things, but, you know, social isolation, engagement have all been um, spoken about. I wonder if, again, each of you could speak about what you think are the most important kind of exposures, um, social exposures, not genetic ones, um, which will happen from another panel, but things that are maybe modifiable in um, a kind of a social sense. Um, and maybe Alex will start with you this time. Yeah, sure. I think that the most important challenge for healthy aging in the 21st century is the growing inequalities. We will have people that will have access to excellent treatment, excellent services, very good eating, uh, plenty of opportunity not to be a sedentary, um, financial accumulation of resources, while we have people in the United States, in Brazil, uh, countries that unfortunately are champions in terms of inequalities, that will have none of that. So I think that the most important thing that I would focus as a policymaker is how to deal with inequalities because we are punishing to people and turning the most important social achievement of the last century, which is possibility of aging into, for many people, a torture. And COVID has shown us graphically the effect and the impact of inequality in our life course. So before we go to you, can I just um, ask you just to push that a little bit farther when you think about where interventions are most likely to be effective to reduce inequalities? So where, where do you think about where they might be? Definitely education. And the opportunities for education are being denied. We have seen the public education going down. And unfortunately, with the, <laughs> our leaders exposing a total lack of health literacy, of science, science understanding, if we don't deal with this, even at the top in our public leaders, what, what about ordinary citizens that cannot really have access to the basics in order to deal a life that could improve their chances of a longer life with quality of life. Great, thank you. Joaf, your turn. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I agree with, a lot with what Alex says. I mean, clearly to me, socioeconomic determinants are incredibly powerful because of this risk clustering phenomenon. So if you're born in a poor family or you have a poor adult life, depending on which society or culture you live, you inevitably tend to be exposed to more adverse exposures, be it smoking, poor diet, air pollution, and so on. Um, I, I do, and I also actually very much share Alex's view about educational opportunities, uh, because we know they are so important for determining later adult socioeconomic status. But one thing uh, that I was very struck, and this comes from low middle income country settings, so it probably uh, is not so relevant for higher income country settings, but uh, one of the wonderful cohorts collaboration, which looked at five cohort studies in low middle income country settings from Brazil, Guatemala, Philippines, India, South Africa, they all showed that low birth weight, I poor intrauterine development, and very importantly, poor diet and development, either through nutrition or infection, in the first few years of life, had irreversible long term effects on growth stunting, which in turn was associated with obviously less educational outcomes higher blood pressure, higher levels of obesity. 
So early life, which has been, a, I know WHO have, have pushed this quite a lot. There are some settings whereby the, the investment in early life in childhood are particularly important. I think that's probably not as relevant in high income country settings, but it probably has some relevance as well. That's great. That's very helpful. So if again, I could like just ask you to extend that. So when you think about UK or US, uh, um, you know, or high income challenge in countries and what they're challenged with, if it, if it isn't exclusively this early part, where along the later car, of course, do you think are the most promising kinds of interventions or where are the, the major issues? Well, there's the one thing that is important also to add here is that you have pockets of developing countries within your country. Yes. As well as in the United Kingdom. So it's not to say that developed countries are homogeneous because the right. lack of opportunities for a big chunk, and this has a very strong racial component. Yeah, yes, I think that's very helpful and true. Yeah, do you have a... Yeah, I think I, I always slightly hesitate because... First of all, you have to look at different outcomes. You know, we, we've talked about heart disease. We haven't talked particularly about psychological health and well-being. We haven't talked about cancer. And sometimes some of these exposures can actually operate in different directions. They can be bad for some things and good for another thing. So I've just talked about growth and development. Again, there's some really interesting research, some from our department, but from Denmark, looking at how more rapid growth trajectories around the age of seven to 15 are associated with higher rates of breast cancer in women. So it's, the, the picture is a little bit more complicated, but overall, um, poor opportunities, deprivation, and so on, would, in terms of public health impact, would have the greater impact. But it, it is a bit more complicated, depending yeah. on what you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, very, it's, it's a very interesting question. I think in our work, just to interject a little bit, we've focused a lot on early adulthood and middle age, that the opportunities that people have for work, for jobs, which of course is dependent to some extent on education, but, but to some extent not. It's like how many good jobs are there out there and family formation are also kind of incredibly important developmental kind of middle age um, kinds of factors um, to focus on, on as well during this. So if I could um, just take the last minute or so before we open it up and, and just to ask you, when you think about like training another generation um, of uh, both, both practitioners and you know, researchers, like what are the training or the policy kind of implications? What is the world going to look like? And what do we have to be training people for in the next, uh, in the next decade really as as this becomes um, more and more important in terms of aging societies. If I could make a short comment on this. The first thing, Lisa, is that in terms of educating and training health professionals, we are by and large training doctors, nurses, nutritionists for the last century. They learn everything about child development, but very little about aging and they will increasingly deal with older age. This is the century where old age is going to be predominant. You take, for instance, my country. Today, we have 15% of the population over 60. 30 years ago, it was only five. 30 years from now, in 2050, we will be 31%. And if we don't train health professionals for the 21st century, we are going to fail miserably because they will make mistakes and I often say to medical students looking at their eye, you are going to kill your patients, ignorant, not even suspecting that you are doing this. Please open your eyes and realize that if you work for as long as I have been working, 50 years, you end up your professional career in 2075, when there will be more people celebrating eight years of age than babies being born. Great. Thank the you. Only other, clear. Go ahead. Yeah. The only other quick comment is, you know, we spent the last 50 years in medicine becoming more and more super specialist. You know, you're not, you're not just an endocrinologist, you're a super whatever growth hormone endocrinologist. And of course, the one big challenge we all have now is multimorbidity. Medicine's done a great job keep, keeping people alive, but they're keeping it alive with their heart failure, with their COPD and so on. And patients now 
need people who can look across different disease entities and help people function as well as they can, not just from a medical, but also from a social point of view as well. So I think the challenge of multimorbidity is definitely future medical students, that's what they have to face. Excellent, excellent. That actually leads us um, perfectly into some of the questions that we're getting um, from our alumni. So one of them really focuses on um, aging as like a disease of comorbidity. In fact, um, we might think about that. And when we think about ways um, either to refute this as a, as a paradigm or to think about early biomarkers. So people often, you know, hear a little bit about telomeres or, you know, biological clocks and then being able to inter intervene like earlier in this, you know, biological process that then puts people at risk for so many diseases. Where, where do the two of you stand um, on this? And maybe you all, if you want to start and we'll follow up with Alex. Yeah, so um, uh, my conceptual understanding of aging is it's not just to do with diseases. Of clearly, diseases may be a product of premature aging. So someone who has premature vascular disease because they have, they have a familial a hypercholesteremia, for example. But to me, aging either at a molecular or a system level can, does happen in the absence of comorbidity. So it's not just about comorbidities. And to me, it's about the ability of the body, either at a cellular physiological system level or at a whole level, to adapt and respond to an external stressor. So, you know, take COVID, uh, you know, is in all our minds now, the ability to mount an immune response. Some people have a, an aging immuno, immunological system, they have immunosenescence. So when given the trigger of a viral um, uh, invader, they cannot mount uh, an adequate immune response. That would be the aging immune system. It's got nothing to do about whether they've got an autoimmune disorder or some other thing. It's just that the body, physiological systems eventually start to go wrong. Great, that's a, that's a very clear answer and hope it's helpful to um, the person who posed it. Alex? I would only add, Lisa, uh, that there are age-associated diseases, and there is no question that with the number of years you live, you may be at a higher risk of a specific chronic disease. But that is not to say that old age is a disease. And I'm saying this because right now, there is a big discussion, and I'm right at the center of this discussion, because the international classification of diseases, which is absolutely essential for us to have parameters and to have epidemiological data, and WHO is about to adopt the 11th version of the international classification of disease from 1st of January, and there is a box there that puts old age as a cause of death. You can imagine the confusion that this would be created in 10 years time. And it was completely out of the radar. It was necessary for the Duke of Edinburgh with the royal physician is stamping in his death certificate, old age as cause of death. Uh -huh. I am not going to wait for the Queen Elizabeth to die in old age to start making noise. I know that I'm going to die in old age because I am already old, but it's not going to be <laughs> of old age. It's going to be a, a disease with name and surname. And I ask you to make noise, to put pressure on WHO. We only have three months for this to be reversed. And this is wonderful. This is such a helpful, this is a great, Great panel for the two of you. So let me ask you another question that is a little bit complex. It's coming from somebody who was asking about ways to reduce socioeconomic disparities um, in, in ways other than reducing what we would call like primary or even primordial prevention, that is changing education or um, income or something like that. And I think the question has to do and it's not an either or in, in my work either, that we can think about like these kind of very primary kind of um, determinants as well as moderating or mediating kind of determinants and things that we can do along the pathway. Um, could, you, could you both address what you think about uh, like the opportunities um, for reducing disparities um, kind of in the face of educational differences? So, you know, once somebody's 20, you know, what, what, what opportunities are out there? Oh, let me jump first here, Yova. 
Uh, I think that we have already mentioned education and we all agree that this is absolutely critical. But what is the point of telling somebody, you have to eat broccoli every day, but how can I buy broccoli the first week of the, the month if I don't have money to buy sugar and flour at the last week of the, the mm -hmm. month? How can I not be sedentary? If I go to work with a horrible public transport system, I'm talking about Brazil, I'm talking about the developing world, I'm talking about 83% of all the people that we'll, we will have in 2050 in poorer countries. And this is the challenge. You cannot go out and go for a walk. It's unsafe. You have stray bullets. Um, you don't have a pavement. You don't have electricity to illuminate where you live. Brazil, for instance, is a country where you may have a smartphone in your hand and your feet on the sewage. So in order to decrease this bad start throughout your life, but from the very beginning, you need good governance and you need, I'm sorry to say, more government rather than less. Because mm -hmm. if we allow just for society to correct this, we may wait another century. Well, thank you, that's powerful. Yav? Yeah, I would totally spoil Alex. I mean, we've got decades of health promotion literature which shows that focusing on individual risk factors at an individual level either doesn't work or if anything, it widens health disparities because the more affluent, more educated, are more likely to follow the advice and the poor folk don't. And where things do work, they tend to be structural. So for example, uh, governments make it easier to access or provide for, for children. We, we had a study in Bristol where uh, all children, whether you're rich or poor, could go swimming at the local swimming pool for nothing. They subsidized it. And lo and behold, we found that actually had a benefit across all social strata. If you just told people to go swimming, well, it would have made things worse rather than better. So I think, you know, whether it's transportation system to encourage people to walk or to cycle to work or whatever, it needs to be top down. It needs to be structural rather than just telling people what to do, because they, as Alex says, if they got no money, they can't do it anyway, even if they want to. Wow, great. Well, I think um, um, these have been fabulous, fabulous responses, and there are a lot more questions. And unfortunately, I think our time is running out. But I do, I do want to recognize some of the questions as we close for people to think about. And many of them, I think, will spill over over the next couple of days. Um, and one of them is about ageism and discrimination. And I actually am not going to ask you to respond, even though I know you're like, you both are the world's expert um, in doing this. We're just going to be out of time, but I do think that ageism is something that we absolutely need to confront. The kinds of stereotypes that we have, the kind of issues that we bring to what opportunities older people have is, is very central to our planning. And there was another one about changing the trajectories of functional decline, which I think is, is something that actually is completely inherent um, in this life course work is that our goal is to change a set point, but also to change a trajectory. So I very much appreciate the questions that have come from the panel um, and the alumni. And I'm sorry, we don't have two more hours to talk about this, um, but I just wanna thank you both um, for really extraordinarily open and upfront and helpful answers that will push policy forward um, in regard to helping aging. I wanna also say one thing about um, what the school's initiatives are. As you said, um, as Michelle said in the beginning, you know, we have a set of research initiatives. We also um, have a very, very important goal. And I know alumni are sensitive to this to support um, student financial aid. So quite apart from the panel today, I wanna just give you a pitch um, for supporting for alumni to support financial aid um, that we lose many, many students um, in the pipeline, as Alex and Yo have said, that education and poverty go hand in hand. And it's very hard to get a higher education um, when the economic burden is so high. So we, we hope you'll um, um, support us. And I just again wanna thank you all for joining us today. 
And please join us for tomorrow's panel where we have a panel of experts discussing um, of all things, the impact of racism and health inequalities and health inequities um, on population health. So you've, uh, Joav and Alex, you've kicked off what I think is a very, very important discussion. Um, I hope all to the alumni, I hope you all will get to take advantage of the programming that is happening this week. And we'll drop the link for the entire programming schedule into the question and answer box. Um, and so thank you again, um, the two of you for giving us a very stimulating and honest and straightforward and compelling um, set of comments about- Lisa, I can't help but to say one thing in 30 seconds. All yes. forms of is sexism, racism, ageism, LGBT, all of them derive from four eyes. The ideology that I'm worth more than you are, institutionalizing, so the interventions that will put that ideology in place. The third eye is interpersonal. I will demoralize your self-esteem and self-confidence. And then the fourth eye is internalizing. I end up believing that I am worth less than you are. It applies to sexism, to racism, to ageism, and you are absolutely right. It is an epidemic of ageism that we have to fight. Thank you, thank you. I think that's really important. And y'all, if we actually have one more minute or two, I feel like I'm a radio announcer here. Before we close out, <laughs> would you like to make a last comment on whatever you feel is most compelling? Oh, I was just gonna ask, somebody asked a question about saying it must be really hard to, to follow people up from birth, repeated survey to adulthood. And I just wanted to say, that's exactly what we have in the United Kingdom with the National Health of Survey and Development, which followed up babies from 1946 is still following them up, now doing PET scans, MRI scans of, the, of their brains. So it is possible, but it needs a lot of political will and funding, so it's not easy to do. Yes, well, well said, because we could certainly use in the United States some of those birth cohorts that the UK has been so successful in mounting. Um, so I wanna thank you again, and I think we'll close it out. Um, and uh, we wish, all the alumni, good luck and best wishes in your work. And thank you again, the two panelists.